See, hard days don't have to be bad days. Hard times don't have to be bad times. You might be in the middle of a hard day or a hard time, but can I just encourage you with, if you make the decision to choose joy and to ask God for wisdom and determine to keep hope alive in this hard day, it won't be the one that defines you. It will be the impetus that will get you through. Sisters, we can't wait to roll out the red carpet for you at Sisters of Africa 2022. Conference is less than five weeks away, so make sure you've booked your seat for three days of inspiration, connection, worship, and input to inspire you for your hopes and dreams. Plus, register your kids aged one to grade seven for Kids Africa Conference running simultaneously. The Academy of Hopes and Dreams will inspire your little ones to dream big for the things of God with worship, games, ministry, and prizes. Don't delay. Register yourself and a friend after the service, and we'll see you at Sisters of Africa 2022. Father, I pray this morning that you'd speak to every heart, that you'd make the word relevant to us, that, Lord, we would receive the points and the message as, it, as, as I intended, but, Lord, would you speak way beyond it, would you give people little notes on the side and little things to write at the back and points that speak to their lives. And I just pray for the work of the Spirit, the work of the power of God in this place. We're not just communicators. This is not Toastmasters. We want to impart something spiritual. And so I pray, make us receptive, free us from worry, distractions, and messages on our cell phone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Did you get the hint in my prayer? Terrible when you're making notes and someone says, are you coming for lunch? Yes, what are you serving? And I'm making an important point. You can be seated. I was reading recently and uh, from 2018, these stats right up till today seem to be accurate. But they're saying in South Africa, listen to this, in 2018 in South Africa before covid Bet uh, uh, people between 18 and 34, that's young adults, 42% are still living with their parents. Isn't that interesting? You know, when I was 16, I wanted to run away from home. But apparently 18 to 34-year-olds are staying at home. Then there's another stat that says that, tr that, that young adults between 25 and 35, they're a bit older, 31% of them are still living with their parents. Many young adults, they say, are leaving later, but this is the interesting stat. They are all going back home after living on their own because it appears that home is actually better than being away. Isn't that interesting? They say there is no place like home. At our church, we say, welcome home. Even restaurants are using that slogan. And home in a transient world is becoming incredibly valuable. We're going to look at one of the parables of Jesus that you know very well. And we're going to look at a different take on it this morning. And uh, it's from Luke chapter 15. How many of you know in Luke chapter 15, there are stories of lost things? In fact, we mostly think of three, don't we? The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost Son, but I believe in Luke 15, there are actually four lost people. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and the older brother who was at home but lost. And you know what lost means? Lost doesn't mean evil. It means in the wrong place. And a lot of people today, because of COVID, because of the pandemic, their attitude to church has changed. Their attitude to the kingdom of God has changed. We now view home as online watching a message rather than engaging with relatives and serving and building together. And I want to speak to you this morning. I've entitled the message, Come Back Home. You say, well, we're in church. The older brother was in church. The older brother was, in, he was at home, but he wasn't at home. He was at home, but he was lost. And I believe as we look at the message this morning, God might speak to you because this is most, one of the most wonderful stories. They say it's the greatest story ever told. It's so rich in grace and mercy and kindness. It's the most famous and most loved passage of the Bible, according to commentators. And uh, the main theme is someone who left home 
and then recognized that home was the best place to be. It's also someone who was at home and didn't realize how valuable home actually was. Isn't that true? And there's so many people who have got a wrong understanding of the church, of the kingdom, and of what it means to be home. I don't mean today that by being home, you're in church. It's much more than that. It's belonging to the kingdom and being rooted in it is actually home. And many of us, after this pandemic, need to come fully home. Because church has changed and people's perception of church has changed. Is it a video message? No, it's not. It's a brilliant alternative, but we've got to come back home. Interesting how people view their spiritual home or view church. The actress Sissy Spasick said this, Nature is my church. The wind and the trees and the bugs and the frogs, all those things are comfort to me. No, no, I don't need the bugs and the frogs. If I want to be comforted, I just get a big slab of lint. <laughs> but that lint is not church. Neither of bugs, neither of frogs, neither is good weather, neither is the golf course. Talking about golfing, some of you may remember this golfer, John Daly, PGA golfer. He says, I'm not a religious person. I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, but I don't go to church like I should. Many people like this. They view church as something additional, something strange, not as home. Nicky Gumbel from Holy Trinity Brompton, he's just re retired from there after 40 years serving that church. He says, church is not an organization you join. It is a family where you belong, a home where you are loved, and a hospital where you find healing. Church is valuable. The American writer and theologian Frederick Buchner said this. He said, for some people, going to church is going home. In a very profound sense, I would say the same thing. Home is where Christ is. And I would add, as we read the parable in a moment, home is where the Father is. Luke chapter 15 and reading from verse 11. This is going to be more scripture than some of you have read in a while. But we need to dig into this treasure this morning, and then I'll give you four principles from it. Are you ready? Yeah. I felt the scripture come alive in me about two weeks ago, and I've been eager to preach it, and I hope it comes with the same impact that God brought it to my heart. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. I want you to notice the word sons, because six times the word sons is mentioned. He didn't say congregants. Sons. The younger one said to his father, Father... Give me, notice that, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between, between? How many of you know when you read about the prodigal son, you often think he got his money and the other oak just stayed home? No, no. We're going to get to it in a moment and you're going to just see what the other brother actually got. But let's read on. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, his iPad and his iPhone and his earbuds earpods, whatever, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. There are Christians living with citizens of the wrong country. You sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Can you believe you can get to a place where pigs eat better than you? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants, volunteers in the house, have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, he made up his mind and he spoke, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me. You see, he first said, give me, and now he says, make me. Like one of your hired servants, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, 
bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Don't forget that. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Let's, can you just pause there? Some people think church should be dour. The music should be quiet. No, we need to celebrate. <laughs> In fact, Ron Canoli sang a song, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. We used to sing it in the zone and some of the people were like. <laughs> it's the Bible here, Jesus speaking. When people get saved at the end of the service, if people receive Jesus or when people receive Jesus like they always do in our service, you should clap and cheer. It's a wonderful thing. Can you say amen? And then got to find my place. Twenty-five? Thank you. Meanwhile, how many of you know when there's a meanwhile? It's something completely different. It's like a bat. Some people have got a very big bat. It's like a big meanwhile. You know, God says, but meanwhile, notice this, this is in church. The oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go to Rivers Church. <laughs> so his father went and pleaded with him. I don't believe God should plead with us to come to his house. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Take note of the word, slaving for you. And I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, be careful how you view other Christians, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, no one said that, comes home, you kill the fat and call for him. My son, the father says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. How come he didn't know that? But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. That's what it means when you're away from God. You're dead and is alive again. He was lost. He was in the wrong place and is found. I believe the reason why we leave the kingdom and we leave church attendance is because we forget how valuable the house is. Number one, the first principle I learned from this that I hope you will catch today is give me makes us leave home, make, make me brings us back. There are so many Christians today who view church as give me. I'll come to sisters on Friday night if the teaching is good. No, no, come to sisters on Friday night because we're part of making something. We're developing something. And uh, stay at Rivers. You may have gone online during COVID, but you know what? Now suddenly you discover, oh, I didn't know about so-and-so. And I didn't know about so-and-so. So now you've chosen to get what you want rather than to come and be made. Give me is the beginning of trouble in church life. Make me is you'll stay rooted in the house and you will serve God. And here he asks for his inheritance before the time. His father gives it to him. He divides it up. You see, God knows you've got a free will. He won't keep you bound. The father loves you. Nothing wrong with the father. Generous, kind, full of abundance. And if you want to leave, God will let you. But be careful. Because when you have a give me mindset, you're always looking for what you can get. And when you look for what you can get, you'll end up more impoverished. And here, the man has an extreme. In fact, the two brothers had an extreme. The first one says, give me. That's like a prosperity mindset. Church is about believing God and all I can get from him. And if I don't get from God, then something's wrong in my church. I need to go to another church where they can make miracles happen. And then the other one is, you never gave me. In other words, it's like a poverty mindset, anti-prosperity. Do you know that's the two polarized churches in the world today, where meetings are just run where you can get everything you want? and others where they're anti all that. Somewhere in the middle is the true church of God, sound belief. And um, the prodigal here, interestingly, felt entitled to his inheritance before his father was dead. Do you know Hebrews 9 and uh, verse 16 says this, it says, while a person is alive, the world doesn't come into effect. Imagine going to your father, I know you're not dead yet, but 
like, what? Couldn't you wait? And you don't get your inheritance until your father dies. But we've got such an entitled generation that feels they deserve stuff without working for it. He has not even contributed. He wants to take what his father's worked for and he wants to go and squander it. Often what you get for free, you don't value. Listen to me, and you lose. That's why, and I'll say it again, that's why socialism doesn't work because you don't value what you don't earn. And here what he got for free, sometimes what you get for free brings trouble with it. He gets all this money for free, and guess what? He has got no idea of stewardship because he didn't earn it, and he ends up wasting it and losing it all. Some people think if they win the lottery, not people like you in church, because none of you play those numbers. (laughs) You think if you win the lottery, it'll solve your problem. The average person ends up bankrupt after four years after winning the lottery. Because you need stewardship, not just an entitlement, not just money in your hands. Isn't that true? It's interesting when we came back from overseas recently, we went through passport control and there's a set of toilets there. And as you walk towards the toilets, uh, there's a a man standing at the men's toilet and he says, welcome to my office. And everyone smiles and laughs. But you don't know that when you've been in and you come out, then he's jingling money. And basically what he's saying is, I get paid to clean these toilets, but you should be giving me something else because after all, you can go overseas. It's an entitlement. You want to know why a country's got problems? Everyone feels entitled to what they didn't earn. It's history, I think. We've got to get to the place where we recognize we don't deserve anything. But if we trust God, he will help us. Listen, the Bible is interesting. It's got principles that if you will work them and work, you'll be blessed. Anytime you expect anything for nothing, trouble cometh. You see, give me always leads to problems, but make me will always grow you. Recently, uh, Phil, Simi's husband, he changed the battery in the car at battery center. And typically, as people do, they didn't put the battery in properly and tighten the terminals. So the car kept starting and then not starting, starting and not starting. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with it except the terminals were loose. Anyway, they went to eat out one night and they got stuck in the Leonardo. So the security guard came and asked, what's going on? He said, no, the car won't start. So he said, no, I'll bring my, he said, brought his city golf, which was nearly dead. He brought it, didn't ask, it was offered. Brought the city golf, connected it to the car, and it wouldn't start. Because I think his battery was on the last legs too. Anyway, he took the car away and then he came back to Phil and he said, you owe me 500. Phil said, what are you talking about? Just 20 bucks. You offered. And he carried on, he carried on that. Eventually called another security guard to come and get this guy to go away. What is it that people feel they deserve without working? And don't feed it. Listen to me. Support the Rivers Foundation. Don't feed people on the streets. It doesn't help them. There's a guy that stands on the corner, and I didn't intend to talk about this. Stands on the corner near my house. When he first got there, I looked at this guy, and I thought, you've got incredible potential. And so I spoke to him one day. I said to him, and he said, I can't get a job, man. I'm struggling. So it's just temporary. So I used to buy him a pie and a Coke, and I'd pause. I've watched him over four years. Glazed eyes. He doesn't want to work. And I cannot feed his entitlement. Entitlement, give me, will always take you away from God, away from the house, away from prosperity. But make me will always bring information, leadership and support and resources. What's your view of church? Is it give me or make me? And by the way, if your attitude to church and the kingdom is give me, you will only come when you need something. Are you going to church this Sunday? No, I'm doing pretty well. No, 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 you need to go because you need to be made, not because you think you need another word. Some people come, and if the message is good, Pastor Diego was here, I can live on that for three weeks. You got it wrong. You got it wrong. Give me is wrong. Make me will bring you back. Can you say amen? And I believe we're not consumers. We've got to be contributors, and we've got to be disciples. You see, Church is a home where you dwell. Psalm 84, notice this. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. That doesn't mean because the music's good. It means when you dwell, something comes out of you that sustains you. But when you don't dwell, you're living on scraps. 
See, so don't view it as give me. Don't view church as something that you're going to get. It's somewhere where you come for God to make you and to shape your life. You know, the prodigal left, and let me just remind you of this because people get, get it wrong. The Bible says he left and he wasted his money or his resources, his hindrance, on wild living. Don't view the church as the opposite of wild living, dead living. We come to church. No, at the end, when it was appropriate, they celebrated. There was loud music. You could hear it across the field. So church is not wasteful living, but it's certainly celebration. And we need to come to church and enjoy God's house. The one takes away and the other adds. Can you say amen? Number two, you still good? We cannot live away from God's house and still succeed. Don't think that you can live off the momentum of your Christian experience. Some people, they serve God for 10 years. Oh, I know it. I've got it. I've been to college. The momentum of his life did not last very long. And I'm not just talking about church attendance. I'm talking about living in the kingdom. Because when you are not in the kingdom and you're not in church, the alternative is you're with people from a far country. And you think they are your answer. Oh, I'm getting on with them. There's some connections. No, when push comes to shove, they won't even give you what the pigs eat because they don't have the love of God in them. They have only one goal, me, me, me. And they will spend your money, spend your life, squander it, and you think you can, you can sustain it without God. You can't. The momentum of godly living doesn't last. You know how many people I've met and seen over the years who were in church who left and thought they would find themselves only to find that they lost themselves. And this is the story here. Not long after the scripture says he squandered. And here's the thing. He spent everything he had. And you can't spend your life. You have to invest. See, you spend when you go to a restaurant, you spend when you buy clothing, you spend even when you go on a holiday, but you can't just spend, you have to invest. And investing is not always, I'm investing, I'm putting this in the back. No, investing is sometimes tough. On a Sunday morning when you wake up and you are tired, and the, it's 18, some say it was four this morning, I experienced six. How many of you know? If you don't feel like they can give you something, you'll stay in bed. But if you know that it's going to make me, I've got to invest. It's a difference to spend. You can go out and eat at a restaurant, go to Tasha's after this or Signature or wherever you want to go and you can spend. That's great. As long as you came here first and you invested. And too many people are spending their lives instead of investing their lives. And uh, it's not good. It's, you, know, you know what the word prodigal means? A lot of people don't know what it means. Prodigal means wasteful. Wasteful. The, NI, uh, the uh, Revised Standard Version says he, he, it was loose living. The ESV says reckless. You know what that means? When, you, when you're wasteful, there's no boundaries for mind, soul, or body. You just waste that purpose that God has put in your life. And you end up as a citizen in a far country. It was interesting that he had to hire himself out to the citizens of a foreign country. I want you to remember, people who don't serve God, people who don't attend church, are not the same as you. Even if they drive a BMW like you, and they live in the same estate as you, they live in a far country. And if you're not careful, you will end up under the rule and hired by them, whereas the King of Kings is the one who is your master. I said it here earlier, it is so true, we cannot live away from God's house and still succeed. Don't fool yourself. What a person sows, they will reap. And you know what happens to you when, you when you start living away from God? You slowly become a slave and you stop being a son. Now girls, you know you're all sons and sons of God, eh? Because we have to live with the fact that we're the bride of Christ, so don't get touchy. Okay? <laughs> Bible uses these analogies and all the feminists get upset. We're the bride of Christ, so you're the sons of God. But what happened here is he thought his momentum would last. What did the father do when he came back? He said to him, put sandals on his feet. Why sandals? 
because slaves don't have shoes. And so when he came back, he was no longer a son. He had become a slave, trying to live off the momentum of his father's house and his father's money. But you can't live off the momentum of past manner. You've got to come back to being a son. He had put sandals on his feet, ring on his finger was resources. He had the signet ring, you just showed it. They recognized the crest of your father. Or you, you pressed it into wax and they gave you money. And then they put a robe on him because he was filthy from being with pigs and he now got dignity. Don't lose your dignity, ladies. Don't take your clothes off. Because we become slaves instead of sons. By the way, both boys were slaves because the older brother said, I have been slaving for you. No one told you to behave like a slave and think like a slave. You could be in the house and live like a slave, and you could be out of the house and live like a slave. We need to be sons and stay sons and keep asking God to make us so that we don't end up ruined thinking we can live off the momentum. I love what Warren Wiersbe says about this parable. He says, when God is left out of our lives, enjoyment becomes enslavement. How many people haven't gone to parties and sniffed a bit of cocaine and you yeah, still believe in Jesus? And then you look a few years down the road. Hmm? You need to remember this. When he left, he came back. He said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. See, it's not about just being in church. When you sin, you sin against the kingdom that you're part of. And you can be away from church and away from the kingdom, and then you start sinning against the values of heaven. We need to hold fast to the values of heaven. And I love what he says. He says, my father's servants have more food to eat. Do you know, people who are volunteers in the house, and I've heard this across the world, lately it's been like, oh, free labor, and they abuse you. Now, we'll talk about next volunteer meeting, how we're a team, and how God has designed that. Anyway, make sure you don't miss volunteer vision evening. But here's the thing. Volunteers in the house don't get paid, but they get a lot of satisfaction, and they are very well fed. Why? Because they're here all the time. They're on a roster. Many times when they felt they would have liked to lie in bed, now I'm on. And because you're on, you're in. And because you're in, you get fed. And those who don't come, who can come, are impoverished, not even eating the food of pigs. Don't live off the momentum of past successes. Don't ever give me mindset. Have a make me mindset. Mm. I love what D.L. Moody said about church. He said, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. Number three, are you okay? We can be at home, but sullen and disconnected. Many people are in church, but unhappy. And I want to just think about the older brother for a moment because many of us can slip into this and I have known over the years, I have slipped into this when I was a younger Christian. The older brother is a Christian who is in church. He believes, he doesn't understand everything, but here's his, he doesn't want to be too fanatical or too spiritual. But he likes to attend. But he's there watching. And during the worship, the music's very loud. He asked the servant, why is the music so loud? What's going on? They're celebrating. I don't think it's right. You can be like that. God wants you to enjoy everything, but you're like an older brother. You're in the house, but you're disconnected. Hmm? And you're sullen. And he doesn't want to appear too fanatical. He never enjoys his full privileges. He's also, in a sense, lost because he doesn't know his place and privilege, even though he's in the house. Terrible place to be. And I want to encourage you, if you're an older brother, be careful because you, you can end up secretly judging everybody. The older brother immediately judged his brother, the son of yours, and prostitutes. Who said? You jumped to concussions. <laughs> Never said anything about prostitutes, but you can be there, you know. Yeah, I've been coming here a long time, you know. And I don't like, the Bible says he refused to go in. Some people, they don't come into the worship. They stand in the foyer, just having a coffee. 
coffee is a bit hot. Why? Because they don't like the celebration. Because they've, they're in the house, but they've never enjoyed the knowledge of people being saved, born again. They don't know who's sitting here, whose life has been dramatically changed. They've been rescued from darkness, from filth and dirt. And now they're celebrating. They can't enjoy their inheritance, actually. Interesting thing about this brother. You know, I say I call him lost. you know why? The Bible says in the... Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, and you can make notes on this if you want to, Deuteronomy 21 and verse 17, it says this, that the older brother gets two-thirds because he's the firstborn, and then the next guy gets one-third. Are you with me? So the older brother got two-thirds of his inheritance, the guy, the prodigal, only had one-third. He had twice as much as him, but he never enjoyed a cent of it. You never gave me. No, the Bible says here he divided his inheritance between them. How come he didn't grasp what he had? How come he never received the fullness of the joy of the Holy Spirit and believed for prosperity and healing in his life? No, he's too busy analyzing. Yeah, they tell me where to park. Now they tell me where to sit and the music's loud. And do they have to have so many lights? You see, that's a person who's given me because all they want is the message. They don't want make me because that will change their paradigm. He had a lot more, but he never enjoyed it. Gosh, I want you to come back home and enjoy the house. Celebrate, stop casting aspersions, stop judging the person next to you. I'll tell you what, if you're not careful, like the prodigal, you will also become a slave. Because you'll be deprived of every blessing that God has because of your thinking. Number four, home is the place where everyone loves everyone. Well, that should be the case, eh? You see, citizens of another country wouldn't even give him something to eat. But God's people, when you're down and out, they will give you something to eat. They will help you. They will support you. It's not just where God loves us. It's where we love one another. And if we're going to call this welcome home, let's make sure we love God and love our neighbor because those are the two basic commandments. And even if we see people failing and sinning and falling away and wasting their lives, if they come to the house of God, let's celebrate. Let's receive them. Let's make sure we don't create an atmosphere that repels sinners because that's what the Pharisees did. Jesus attracted sinners. If you read the beginning of Luke chapter 15, it says that the, he sat with tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees criticized him. What atmosphere are we building here? Or can anyone come in here and come to Christ? Hmm? It's a place where we love one another. Family. Family. I can remind you, if you sit at a family table and you've got all age groups, you know, usually you have the whole family eating and granny and grandpa and the parents and then, then you've got teenagers or you've got a 20 something and you've got a, then you've got a 19 year old and then you've got a 16 year old or a 15 year old maybe and then you've got a 4 year old guess who complains about the 4 year old messing his food not grandpa not granny, granny's like oh don't mess, come let me wipe it put it in the plate and the parents are looking like you didn't do that with me anyway <laughs> Here's the point. As you get older and more mature, you become more tolerant. Who's the one at the table that's complaining? It's usually the 14-year-old or the 15-year-old. Look what he's doing. He's messing on the floor, Dad. A sign of immaturity is that you point out other people's faults in church instead of have the grace to overlook them. Warren Wiersbe said this in his Bible exposition commentary of the older brother, stay with me here, he says, we must admit that the elder brother had some virtues that are commendable. He worked hard, always obeyed his father, he never brought disgrace either to the home or to the village, and apparently he had enough friends so that he could have planned an enjoyable party. He seems like a good solid citizen and compared to his younger brother, almost a saint. However, Important as obedience and diligence are, they are not the only tests of character. Jesus taught that the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love others. But the elder brother broke both of these divine commandments. He did not love God, and he did not love his brother. The elder brother would not forgive his brother who wasted the family inheritance and disgraced the family name, but neither would he forgive his father 
who had graciously forgiven the young man those very sins. See, Jesus didn't compromise when he told the story. He showed care. And we can care for people without compromising. And as I come to a close today, this very, very important thing I want you to note here. When the prodigal came back home, he didn't just blend in, because that's what people are teaching us today. Love, 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 just come back. You smell like a pig, doesn't matter, just sit in the pew. No, no. He had to come back with a new attitude, one of humility, one of, one of uh, submission. And he said, I'm not worthy, make me. I have sinned. So you see, this, they say this is not the complete gospel story because there's no sacrifice. If you take the sacrifice out of love, then it's just become soppy. But Jesus died so that we can now come back, confess our sins, and say, I'm not worthy, make me. And church is the place for sinners. As I come to close here, James, or he said this, he said the secret, sorry, the church is not a select circle of the immaculate, but a home where the outcast may come in. But the outcast has got to come in with humility and with a sense of repentance. You know, when we come back to God after being away from home and messing up and squandering our lives, God is ready to receive us. Do you notice in the story the father was waiting and then the father ran? Do you know in Middle Eastern culture it was very, very improper for an older man to run? But he could not help himself. God can't help himself when he sees you coming. If today you respond to him and you say, Lord, I need you, he will come running. And then it says something interesting. It says he kissed him. It's the same word in the original Greek that is used of Judas kissing Jesus. It's the word kataphalason, and it means kissing many times with affection. Judas betrayed Jesus, kissing him many times with affection, but he was pretending. But when God gets hold of you, he kisses you many times with affection, and he means it.